everyone. This is Sierra Hatfield, Policy Analyst at the Council of State Government HQ here in Lexington, Kentucky. I'm staff the Smart Government Subcommittee at CSD's Future of Work National Task Force. The Smart Government Subcommittee is researching how state governments can implement new technologies for better service delivery without losing the human element that defines public work. I'm here today with Ed Toner, Nebraska CIO, who is here today to talk about how he manages project development, navigates state IT resources, and convinces college students to join his team. So if that sounds good to you, Ed, I'll start with a question from one of our subcommittee members. They say you are either the CIO or you hate the CIO. Is that the case in Nebraska? Um, you know, that, that it, it's clearly um, uh, something that every CIO has to uh, address. And I believe that that's probably the case in a lot of areas. Hopefully it's not the case here in Nebraska. Um, I think the only way to counter that is to make sure that you spend a lot of time with your customers, talking to your customers, explaining changes, um, things of that sort. Um, I feel that the more I network with my customers, the, the agency directors, uh, the less and less that's true. Um, we may not get along with, uh, you know, we may not agree on certain directions that we want to go. Um, but usually we can work out a compromise. But but I, I can definitely um I can definitely relate at times. Um but I think we've always had a, a, a the ability to find some middle ground. Okay, well I'm glad at least. <laughs> so tell me a little bit, um I know you had planned to talk a little bit about project development going on in Nebraska. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all of our projects, we actually have a pretty sophisticated um, set of processes and procedures that were in place uh, prior to me getting here, but they weren't really, you know, it unless you really um, enforce those processes, get people who are buying into the process, um, there's really not much... Um, real um i'd say hammer behind the the the, the process and as far as making statewide standards and statewide um decisions on how um governance and things of that side that point are going to take place <clears throat> here in nebraska in we'll start out in my organization we have a fully developed project management office. We have a resource management project management tool and, and we track our resources very closely and, and we have weekly project meetings. But to support our effort, I'm also the chair of the Nebraska IT Commission. Well, the Nebraska IT Commission has several subcommittees that report up to it and one is a governance committee and a tech panel. And that entire group, even at the NITC and the subcommittee level, that's a cross state uh, membership. So in other words, I represent the office of the CIO here in Nebraska, but also sitting on the board with me is the CIO from the University of Nebraska. Um, it's private industry. Uh, we've got a couple of senators that sit on that board. Um, we have uh, the CIO of Lincoln the local um, Lincoln Public Schools. Um, we have a variety of people that, in open settings, we discuss projects and their viability and whether or not we want to invest in these projects. Um, and those are what we call the enterprise projects. So I've got my internal PMO that's that's working on the projects for the state. Um, the 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 ones that don't meet that enterprise level and that threshold is is usually it's you know a dollar value put on there uh often or the impact of the citizens things of that sort but what we've done in nebraska is every project gets reviewed by that cross-sectional panel 
and is determined whether or not that project is something that is viable and, and should move forward. Um, the tech panel reviews it. They then make recommendations to the overall um, governing board, which is the NITC, and then they also um, approve or deny that request for a project. And then every meeting, they get an update. And then where it intersects with my group is as those enterprise level projects are approved, then weekly they have to come to our, the OCIO's project management meeting and give updates. And the whole purpose of this is really so that, you know, so many projects kind of go off the rails and no one knows about it. Um, and so, when I got here, what, what they were doing was approving projects, and then, you know, the follow-ups were um, everything's fine, you know, and then we we find out much later down the road, sometimes when it's too late to save the project, that the project was actually, in pro, uh, you know, having problems. So the, the differences that we've made here is that we get weekly updates. The project managers for the enterprise projects come to our office, depending on, it doesn't matter what agency they represent they have to come to our office and uh, explain where they are um, gives us the opportunity to assist them in any way that they need assistance um, and really it helps us to become much more more successful so we've got multiple layers and i think what's really unique about nebraska is that every big project and when we're talking about big projects it's things in the millions of dollars um, get reviewed by the citizens and multi, uh, you know, cross-sectional groups before they ever get started. Okay, so it's, let me think about how to phrase this. So if it is like a layered process with multiple stakeholders, multiple kind of reviewees, um, how do you know when to pull the plug on a project that just might not be working? Yeah, that's a really that's a that's a really good question. Um, you know, in 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 here in Nebraska, uh, we we I have personally pulled the plug um, on a couple of projects. Um, luckily, they didn't get too far down the road. Um, they never got anywhere near. One was still in requirements, and I pulled the project the, the plug on it. And one was. Um, a little further along um, than what we wanted it to be, but it actually turned out to be very well. Uh, we, we took another course. Um, when I really, the thing that that really makes me determine whether or not to pull the plug is, is there another viable option that would be cheaper and bring as good, if not better experience to the customer. Um, often the project may be one project, I pulled the plug on it because it was based on a false premise. Um, and that false premise was that support was going to be ended for uh, the current tool. Well, what had happened was, I believe they, they started the project in good faith. Um, the vendor then, after the project got started, the vendor had um, reversed their decision to not support the platform. Um, it's actually being supported now to, for another 10 years. Um, and all we had to do was upgrade to the, to the latest version. Um, so I look for things like that. Was there anything that changed from the beginning of the project to uh, the current situation we're in. That project was was starting to um, go into the yellow and the red status, um, which made me look at it much closer and then find out um, it was based really on a, on a false premise. Um, another project I pulled was uh, we were spending much too long um, in requirements. Um, and so I pulled the project because they clearly we were not articulating or uh, the vendor was not understanding what we wanted. Uh, we had spent years in the requirements phase and I decided if we can't get out of the requirements phase, we need to kill this 
and uh, go another way. And in that case, again, it, it became a modernization of the platform we had. Uh, they were, uh, again, going down the, the, the path that many people do, which is I think they were trying to get the requirements to fit their current tool and not the new tool. And, and it was one of those things that uh, after discussion with the agency, they would rather that I'd come in uh, at a much lower cost and just modernize their platform. So both projects that I that I actually killed were one was just modernization of their current platform, and the second one was even easier, and that was just going to the latest version. Um, so there's a lot of different. I, I think too often agencies are looking for that easy button. They've got a problem and they don't know how to solve it. And um, and this is not. Um, the vendor's fault, but the vendor comes in and actually does try to solve it for them and gives them that easy button. But what happens is um, there has to be a commitment from both sides and there has to be an understanding of both sides. And I think in both those cases, after sitting down with the agency directors that were um, championing those projects, uh, we were able to find that, that what they really weren't looking for was a new product um, they were just looking for a product that uh, could be supported, um, could be modernized um, into the future. So I think those are some, you know, I think every time I look at a project and I see that it's going wrong, I, I, I look at those type of things is, are we spending what, you know, what what phase of the project life cycle are we, are we, are we stuck in? Why are we stuck there? And then the other thing is, did, did, did the project, really is it based on a false premise that that they're going to have this this uh easy button approach that will solve all their problems and when they find out that um even if they were successful this isn't going to solve their problems um it's going to take both uh a business process change and a technology change then then often that's a real signal that um yeah we need to revisit this project Okay, that makes sense. So uh, you've mentioned cost a little bit and about you know improving service delivery for customers. So can you talk to me a little bit about how you manage all of these different state IT resources to make these things happen? Yeah, we publish um, actually on the NITC website, we publish our roadmap. We let our customers know where we're going and why, what direction we're going in and why. Uh, we also get feedback from them on what they would like to see. And I think we do something that's that's really paid off dividends. Um, and that is that we have an active program of application portfolio management where we go to every agency, we help them catalog their applications that they use uh, we have them um, score their applications into um, the Gartner model of okay this is this is an application that's you know got good business good uh, technical support well done not not a very niche group of users and we'll tolerate that one and then we have the invest quadrant where this is key to their business and they really need to invest and really focus on redundancy and availability and, and reliability of that of that system and enhancements in that system. And then we have the migrate applications where we say, you know, either we need to get rid of this or we need to improve it and bring it into the uh, invest quadrant. And and then we have the eliminate. And so we, we look at each of their applications and determine, is this something you really need? Um, and we do that across the state. Now, how that helps them is we've categorized you know 1700 applications and often we'll get a request for something that now that we've done our inventory we can tell them hey we've got an application that's very similar to what you are requesting uh let's give you a demo of it um it's going now the opposite direction where they don't even start a project until they call us and say can we look at the state application portfolio management system and see if there's anything there that we can use. Uh, clearly, that's a more efficient, more effective way to go. 
So essentially, it's a it's a service catalog. It's a catalog of all applications, and then they also know um, what uh, level of maturity uh, that application is in. And so um, that's a really good way. We've <laughs> just yesterday found out there was an application at one agency that they had been paying for for years. They didn't know that they were actually, uh, you know, they put it in the eliminate quadrant thinking that they had eliminated it years ago and yet uh, it's been running in our data center um, and they've been paying for the servers and things like that for years and so um, that has really been a a great tool for us but it also is a great tool for the agencies because that's where they start they, they start at what do we have now that could fit our niche needs the other thing we do is all new technology purchases um, come through our office, and of course we we match the technology request against our known inventory to ensure that we're not doing any um, we're not having any redundancy um, within our system, and we're lowering costs through that method. But then we're also going to each agency and saying. You know, we found three versions of the same tool. Um, maybe not identical, but they, they do the same thing. And we get the agencies together, and we normally just pick the best one and then retire the other ones. So there's a lot of different ways that we that we manage the requests. And, of course, uh, some of the requests come through that are, are clearly tools that are, are specific to the agencies, and, and then uh, we help them. Um, with that process and and a lot of times that goes uh, we we but we always assist in the RFP and making sure that it aligns with our strategy um, and that's one of the, the the more unique things here in Nebraska is that every IT purchase comes through our office for review uh, and I sign off on on each IT purchase. So it sounds like you must have pretty good like communication avenues with these other agencies is your like IT communication processes are those centralized yes we are 100 percent centralized here in the state uh, of course we don't have the legislative branch but we we have the judicial branch um, in our um, two data centers we also have all code agencies and then we ended up picking up non-code and then our reach extends out to um, 86 of the 93 counties we do full support for, and uh, one city, the city of Lincoln, we have all of their, uh, they have no data center, we take care of everything for the city of Lincoln, and then we partner with the city of Omaha, so those are the two largest cities here in Nebraska. So, what about, uh, like, things like email? Is that like, a, is it a statewide system or is that, you know, yes. I'm just, I mean, I'm interested in uh, just the, the amount of communication that must go on between your office and everyone else if everyone's asking about how can we save money with these different apps, you know, what's available. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you know, this is where consolidation has really helped. Um, our rules here in Nebraska are that enterprise tools are all owned by the office of the CIO. And, and what's an enterprise tool? Well, if more than one agency uses the tool, it's an enterprise tool. And then we provide the support. Um, and uh, all tools, regardless of whether they're enterprise, have to reside and be managed by our uh, infrastructure staff. So um, even, you know, any thing that's, let's say it's a, a something specific to HHS, well, the hardware sits here, we manage that, we have the admin rights to that, and, and, and the beauty of that is that they have to push code, they can get into their test environments, uh, but we push code to the production environment because, and, and again, that's a good um, uh, safety um, measure, security measure, because we scan the code and then we move it into production prior to uh, prior to moving into production, you know, we ensure that all those defects and things that we find 
in the code get resolved and then we move it into production. But limiting that access, so we, we've done the, uh, you know, I think one of the big things, which is um, really limiting those um, admin rights or, you know, those, those um, folks that can get into databases and applications. Um, no one has that, even, even their own applications, they can't get into um, manage the production environment. We, we manage the production environment across the state. Um, with that, we force communication. Um, they have to put in change tickets, in other words, because there's no other way that we would know to push their code. Um, they have to, you know, um, participate in our incident management, our service request offerings, um, our project management um, offerings, because if they need our team um, to assist them, which every project does, we have to stand up servers, we have to do things of that sort, um, they have to really uh, follow our processes. So we have one tool that we use for incident management, change management, problem management, service requests, um, CMDB, and the CMDB is of course being populated with what I talked about before, our inventory um, of applications. Um, so I guess we've kind of, you know, project management, they've got to use our project management tool because that's that's how we manage the projects. So there is a lot of communication that has that is forced by our processes to communicate with us because if they want something we don't really communicate and 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 my rule here at the state is you know a, uh, an email is not a service request and an email is not an incident request and it has nothing to do with the project you got to really put in a project request you've got to put in an incident you got to put in a service request you got to to work with us through our systems. And so we we communicate through those tools and what's uh, and we have one tool that we use across the entire state. Um, even the agency, even the, the counties, they go to our website, go to our portal, or call our service desk and, and communicate that way. Um, and so that's really our our how we enforce our standards is really through standard tools. Uh, we we eliminate if there's two of anything, we eliminate it. Um, we eliminate the one that that is uh, either um, not cost efficient or just doesn't fit our needs. So there is quite a bit of communication that that goes on across the state, um, and and I, I think that is really forced just by the, the structure that we've put in over the last few years. So it sounds like the structure that you just described is pretty efficient. I mean, uh, just like you said, you know, if there's two of anything, you can cut one. So uh, your process or Nebraska's process, is that something that you would kind of encourage other states to think about maybe if they wanted to revamp or remodel their uh, the IT process, would you kind of say, you know, maybe you look towards Nebraska because this is what we're doing and it works? Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, we, with the savings that that structure has um, provided, and the savings is in excess of $10 million a year, we've really put a lot of focus into reliability and availability. So, in other words, there are no servers sitting under desks. Everything runs in our two data centers. And if it is in that upper right quadrant where they say, yes, this is invest, this is a critical application for us, those applications are fully redundant and they, they are active, active running between the two data centers. Even our mainframe runs between the two data centers um, and 21 agencies um, rely on the mainframe. And we have moved it from Lincoln. You know, we have one entire um, setup in Lincoln, one in Omaha, uh, 
several months ago, we were running out of Lincoln. We're now running out of Omaha. Um, we do the same thing with the counties. Um, the counties, uh, we support all of the courts, all 93. They said we, we put them on um, AS400. We partitioned it 93 times, and then we replicated it to Omaha. Uh, several weeks ago, we had a failure on the AS400. It automatically failed over to the other AS400, so the recovery point and recovery time was zero. Um, and the legislature and the, the the courts realized then that well wait a minute this was a this was a a much better design because they used to have 93 AS400 sitting in one in each county. So you know a lot of people say well how do you you know you say you cut their cost 90 percent well it's pretty easy to do the math they used to pay for an AS400 now they pay for one ninety third of an AS400. And then we convinced them that, you know what, why don't you pay for two uh, AS400s and now you're just paying for two 93rds of the two AS400s and allow us to replicate you in real time. Um, got a note back from them the other day that said, so glad we paid that because uh, we had no disruption to the docket. Everything went well. Uh, the data was there. We didn't even know you moved us to the other uh, data center. So that's just one good example of where you can save a lot of money and even with the savings provide an incredibly um, good um, experience for the customer. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do. One of the things that we found when we consolidated the state was we were, we were fully virtualized in our agency but the other agencies were not. In fact, none of the other agencies had, they all had physical servers. And so a lot of people call me and say, you know, how did you go to one data center to two data centers and then say that you can save $10 million a year? Well, when I can stack, you know, 10 to 20 physical servers onto a single virtual blade, there's a heck of a savings that I just got right there uh, versus them managing one physical server for each and every application. So not only did, did we get rid of the physical servers in the state, um, and we're at about 90%, we're not at 100%, uh, we're still trying to get there, but then we, we did that, we were able to cluster uh, the virtual servers and replicate them uh, across to our other data center. So that's an automatic, in fact, we don't even know what happens. There's times where uh, we'll have a failure in one data center, which is the primary, and it'll fail to the, the secondary automatically, and then we'll figure out um, that it actually happened. And then we have, the advantage there is we have all, all the time in the world to figure out what actually went wrong, which is the case with the S400 went down. Um, there was no disruption in service, and we sat back and, and really had a chance to check out and see what, and it, it turned out to be a hardware failure. And we had the, the, the luxury of uh, getting that fixed because we knew they were up and running with no problems. So um, I think it's working smart um, and working smart means you can save a lot of money and then investing that money into um, availability and redundancy. And that's, that's really what we've done. Okay, cool. So it's kind of like a fail-safe, too. Very, very much. I mean, it, so gives I us, have... it gives us the ability to fight fires on our own time. Okay. Yeah, I like that. So um, I have here in my notes, I know we briefly talked a little bit before this call, um, that all of these, you know, centralization, this consolidation the state took on actually increased the amount of time that you guys had to recruit. So uh, yeah. I'm very interested if you could tell me a little bit about the intern program and how that's been kind of helping out. Yeah, the intern program has been a huge success for us. Um, we have a very, very low attrition rate. And when I say very, very low, we, we um, I think we've only, we, we started this program about four years ago. We've hired 
in our own agency, 26 uh, employees, and then we we have employees that uh, we actually uh, farm out to some of the agencies because they they are in need of technical staff for their own individual um, agency applications. I think we're up to in the 50s now um, as far as new interns. Well, my staff is about 450, and I've got more than 50 um, interns slash we'll say previous interns because now they're they're actually part of our agency. Uh, we go at probably monthly. We focus at the community college layer. We influence their uh, curriculum. Um, they know that that we are there. We are hiring, so we you know that really gives a lot of credibility to um our presence there and our ability to influence their uh what they're teaching um we send to the campus our previous employee our previous interns that are now employees um and they do all of our recruiting for us so essentially we we recruit with our own uh, the people who have gone through the experience. Um, that's brought a lot of life to our group. Um, I would say, um, you know, having the, 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 the young folks um, intertwined with some of our others has really brought uh, a lot of energy. Um, we have the um, community college only teach agile development. They don't teach waterfall. So that they come to us with a good knowledge of waterfall, and then we provide them with uh, a lot of additional training. We we put a lot of money into training, uh, but we don't just hire developers. We hire folks in the infrastructure series. We hire folks in telecom. We hire folks in the site support area or desktop support. We hire them into our service desk and all areas um, of government. And um, often, when another agency needs uh, some assistance um, with their agency specific applications we'll hire the individual and then we'll charge them out to the to the agencies so that uh, they have our management but they're actually 100 percent devoted to the agency application so it's a, it's kind of a an interesting concept uh, the highest ranking person in every the highest ranking IT person in every state agency that that we have an agreement with which is you know multiple um actually reports to one of my direct reports so that's where that continuity that you asked early about is when their highest ranking it individual reports to someone that's a direct report to me and we call them we don't call them it we actually call them business service managers so they're embedded in the agencies but they actually um supervise all of the IT in that agency, uh, they report to us. And because they're embedded in that agency, uh, we've built that relationship that we talked about where um, maybe they don't like me, but they don't hate me uh, because we have that that person in there that is actually an employee of ours that um, really maintains and ensures that they're agency specific applications are working and then they also explain our goals and our mission because uh, they're really part of our team awesome well i'm happy to hear that no one actually hates you <laughs> well i'm i'm not going to go that far but uh at least we've done the right things to uh i think a lot of it is lack of communication i i i know that that's um in many cases, that's true, but I think it's it's due to really lack of communication or maybe lack of input. Um, the agency's feeling like they don't have uh, control, uh, and that could certainly happen in a consolidated environment. Um, in fact, probably consolidated environments foster that type of attitude. But I think if they get some wins out of that consolidated environment. Um, you know, we're our own worst customer because like when we consolidated, 
um, we eliminated more than 10% of the server environment. Um, and that was part of our savings. Um, they saw that as, oh, wait a minute, you're not charging me for that anymore? No, we're not. And so we're our own worst enemy because the better we are um, at gaining those efficiencies, the lower the agency's costs are, and we're 100% charged back. Um, I was just in a budget meeting yesterday, and we've been too successful in some areas, and I'm I'm uh, not getting the revenues that we used to get, and you can just see the revenue dropping. Well, if that revenue is dropping, it's not because the service isn't there. It's because we've been much more efficient in providing the services to the agencies. So when they look at it from a, a cost factor, um, they feel pretty good. Uh, and then the fact that I think we did it a, a little more unique in that we give them full control of their agency specific um, applications. Some don't want that. Some want us to manage it. HHS, we manage all their applications. Um, in fact, we have their entire team reports to our to our office. Uh, so there's some agencies that, that just say, no, we don't want to manage our own. Um, and then there's others that, that certainly do want to manage uh, their own applications. And, and sometimes that that continues to evolve where they've maybe lost a key um, support personnel and they would just rather, instead of recruiting, uh, they'd rather us just take over that, that application support. Right, and that will always be kind of part of those ongoing conversations to keep everyone as happy as you can, I guess. Yep, exactly. Where they're where they're fail safe, the where they're fall back. If um, if they do have a lot of attrition or they lose someone with some knowledge, um, you know, we we can normally go in and and assist them, um, and then uh, oftentimes we'll, they'll just say, "Well, we want you to just take this over." It's it, it, it's amazing that. Um, it was one application this week that we thought was very much a um, patrol only type application, so state patrol. Um, come to find out that other agencies were beginning to use it and use it more and more. Well, patrol uh, came to us and said, "We need you to support this because it's getting it's getting too big for us." So. Um, you know, we were finding out the patrol used it, and uh, so did DMV, so did Cayman Park, so did transportation. Um, and so there's there's um, a demand now to not um, hold those applications close, but rather when they get out of hand to um, hand them over to our group, um, and then we manage those applications. Right. Well, I think those are all the questions that I have for you today. But if you have any final thoughts or anything you'd like to say to the Smart Government Subcommittee as we continue these conversations about, you know, best practices to consolidate, how to optimize, how to get these college kids involved. I, I think it's present. With the college kids, we'll start there. I've actually visited and spoke with the professors um, and have a relationship with the college. And I do speaking engagements at the college. Um, and um, we often bring our past recruits with us on, we always bring them with us on recruiting trips. So it's, it's what you put into it is what you get out of it. I've personally put time in it and it's paid off. My team has personally put in a lot of time, and we have a targeted audience there. As far as standards, we follow the basic ITIL standards, uh, the things that I learned in, in the, the uh, private sector, uh, best practices all the way through. Um, that was definitely lacking when I got here, and now I've got converts that uh, are uh, kind of like ex-smokers. Um, when they when they finally realized what 
how much value having standards um, for their work and knowing exactly what they're supposed to do in every scenario, they are fanatic about it. Um, no, you can't do that because that's not the process, right? Um, so it's amazing how quickly the state adopted private sector best practices. Um, but I don't think that that could have been done without the consolidation first. So we had to set that that um, um, groundwork within our own organization, and then we set the groundwork within the other um, agencies across the state. And now, you know, our our questions now come at least once a month. Can we can we move into your data center and have you manage? And we're actually getting to the point where we are evaluating whether or not that's really, you know, beneficial to us both. And we're not, we're not um, advertising. It's more of a, we're sitting there going, well, is this really going to be something good for us and the state? Um, and so we're, we're no longer evangelizing or trying to convince people to, to consolidate. We're actually being pushed to consolidate more and more and more. Um, agencies that that are not traditionally part of a central um, group like Public Service Commission. We manage everything for the Public Service Commission. We have all their data and we have a centralized uh, GIS team. So there's a lot of weird things that we do here in, in Nebraska, but they um, they seem to work well. Awesome. Well, I'm happy it's working out for y'all. And like I said, I think that we have wrapped up today and thank you so much for being here and and sharing Nebraska's story really highlighting um, all the good things coming out of the state in terms of the IT sector and definitely look forward to working with you again in the future